about a generation ago, and it gives me the shudders to think that it was a generation ago, I was running around the country sitting up all night in cemeteries and sitting on hilltops in remote parts of the country uh, looking for these funny lights in the sky that were everywhere in the 1960s. There was one hilltop in particular that overlooked the Ohio River uh, where there were, at that time, there was a lot of boat traffic on the Ohio River day and night. And these funny lights would come down out of the sky and circle around these boats that were transporting cargo up the Ohio River. And the boatmen would turn on their searchlights and play games with these lights. The lights would jump out of the way of the searchlights. And I was sitting on my hilltop watching them with these games going on. And I would flash this flashlight at these funny lights, and they would jump out of the way of my flashlight. And so I'd flash in Morse code at these lights, and they would do whatever I ordered them to do. And then later, I decided that instead of using Morse code, I'd make up my own code. And they knew this code, <laughs> which gave me a lot of concern at the time. <laughs> and I gradually figured out during this period that we could control these so-called flying saucers. They weren't saucers, they were lights. And I was sitting alone, and one of these lights came down very close to my car and passed over. The, uh, there was a wooded area all around me. These hills were all hill, wooded uh, hills. And it passed over these woods and it seemed to descend right into the forest right next to my car. And the next day when I woke up in my motel room there, my eyes were very sore, like they were full of sand. And this is a common effect of looking at these lights. It's called conjunctivitis. Uh, it's like looking into a bright arc light. And so the fact that my eyes were affected was proof that I had seen something there. Now, in the years 1964, to 1968, there was a worldwide epidemic of these lights. And I don't mean that they were, uh, there was an occasional light in the sky. They were everywhere every damn night of the week. Uh, Time Magazine did big uh, editorials about it. The New York Times did front page stories about it. Now, I, I realized that the best way to tackle this was to pick one or two spots and make them a microcosm of the whole thing and just study everything in that spot. Learn to know the people, uh, study every event that happened, whether it was related to these things or not. We call them UFOs, but that's really not a good name for them. They were like living lights. These lights had an intelligence of their own. I, I uh, made uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, sort of my, my headquarters in 66. My first step in arriving in a, a strange town, a new town, was always to go to the police station and introduce, introduce myself to the police. I, in those days, I, I carried a pile of press credentials. I, I was writing in newspaper columns and so on. So I would interest, introduce myself to the police so that they knew I was uh, just another harmless nut. In November of 1966, four young people in a car, they were driving past this building and they saw what looked like a very large man, uh, six or seven feet tall, standing next to this power plant. And for some reason, they were all, it's, he scared to death of it. They were all scared to death. So the, uh, the boy who was driving hit the, hit the accelerator, and they drove out of there at a high speed. And looking back, this thing rose up in the air and followed their car. And they were going over 60 miles an hour on these dirt roads. And this thing was flying right along with them. So they drove straight to the police station. Now, you have to realize in small towns, teenagers do not go to the police station voluntarily. <laughs> and the police were so convinced by their uh, behavior that, that they held a press conference the next day. And reporters from the local newspapers, from Charlotte, and other cities around there came to hear this very bizarre story of this flying man. At that time, Batman was very popular on television. So the newspapers labeled this creature Mothman. And that was the beginning of the Mothman caper, I guess you'd call it. And the, the next year, 
there were over a hundred reports of this Mothman. Uh, some of the people who reported seeing this thing were not only adults, they were responsible adults like bankers and uh, local officials, the lady who was sort of the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in the Christmas season of 1967, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, there was a bridge called the Silver Bridge that crossed the Ohio River. And on December 15, 1967, that bridge collapsed, and it was loaded down with cars, uh, people who had been Christmas shopping, and that sort of, sort of put a damper on all my investigations. Because I knew some of the people who had gone down with the bridge, and some of these people had been Mothman witnesses. And so I did just one magazine article on the whole subject, and it was a short article, it was about 2,000 words. And I gave one talk on the radio about it, on Long John Neville's show, and that was the extent of my involvement. Now today, when you pick up any uh, encyclopedia of the strange or anything, it always says that John Keel is the center of the Mothman thing. And uh, one of the newspapers in West Virginia did a long editorial against me, saying that I was exploiting the situation and making a big profit from it. Of course, little do they know, I made no profit at all from it.